Let me um, just give you a quick testimony for those of you, maybe this is the first time you've heard me speak and just give me, I want to give you a little bit of a background as to who I am. I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, saved there at the age of eight in a Sunday school class. When I was 10 years old, God called me to missions. I uh, met my wife in college, praise the Lord for a wonderful wife. We went to Alaska. We spent 10 years in Alaska as church planters there, first of all in Juneau, helping to establish Lighthouse Baptist Church. And then we moved to Talkeetna and established Talkeetna Baptist Church. Thought we'd be there the rest of our lives, but then God moved us to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where our mission board is located. I became the far north director there, served in that capacity for seven years. And then God uh, moved me to a new position of president and general director. And this coming June will be uh, eight years that I have served in that capacity. So God has opened up opportunities for us that we're thankful for. Uh, and just glad to be serving the Lord in the area of missions because it is indeed exciting to see what God's doing around the world in Papua New Guinea. Just one example of what God is doing. You have your Bibles there. We've, we've uh, turned to and we have already read this morning John chapter 6 verses 5 through 13. This is a story that I would dare say most of us know well, the feeding of the 5,000. Probably, uh, if you're sitting here this morning, you have probably heard a message or two or three on the feeding of the 5,000. So if that's the case with you, perhaps some of you may have said, all right, I've heard one of these before. And maybe you have kind of said, let's just see how this goes. Let me remind you of something first before you kind of dismiss it and set it off to the side. Other than the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the only miracle that is mentioned in all four gospels of the New Testament. So, you know, if God tells us something one time, it is of utmost importance. So, if God gives it to us four times, it's okay for me to preach this message this morning, even though you may have heard one or two or three before. Now, obviously, as I preach this message, the emphasis today is missions. And the emphasis is faith promise and our part in getting the gospel into all the world. So as we begin the, the scripture passage that we read earlier here, Jesus lifted up his eyes, verse number five. And as he did, the Bible says he saw a great company come unto him. Now it's no accident that the Bible says that Jesus lifted up his eyes. Just a couple of chapters prior to this, as Jesus was with his disciples in John chapter 4, verse 35, he said to them, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. This morning as we are in this service and we're in the middle of this missions conference, I want to ask you to do just what Jesus asked his disciples to do. Would you indeed lift up your eyes and look on the fields? Just as Jesus lifted his eyes and looked on this uh, group of people, this multitude of people that was coming to him today, would you look at the multitude of people in our world today? Think about the population of our world, seven and a half billion people. You know, for us as human beings, it's easy for us to keep our eyes focused on the things that are right around us, the things that are close to us, the things that we see often. But it's important for you and I to do what Jesus said. Lift our eyes, look on the multitudes, and understand there are multitudes of people who have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is our responsibility to do what we can do because that is what Jesus did. You see... When Jesus looked on the multitude, he did so with compassion. The book of Mark tells us, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion. I want to make a distinction here. There is a, a difference between pity and compassion. You see, pity will look at a particular situation and say, Boy, that's, that's bad, that's terrible, I, I really wish that would not have happened. But compassion takes it another step further. You see, compassion looks at that same situation and says, boy, that's, that's bad, that's terrible, I, I really wish that would not have happened. But you know what? There's something I can do to help with that situation. And I'm going to step in and I'm going to do what I can to help. 
Compassion, if you want a short definition, is love in action. Love in action, putting our love into action. And you know, I am glad that as God looked on the world, as God looked on David Snyder, he didn't do so just with pity. I'm glad he didn't look on David Snyder and say, boy, I, I pity him, I feel bad for him because see, he's lost, he doesn't know my son, Jesus Christ, and boy, that's a shame, and I'm glad God didn't stop there. You see, God looked on David Snyder, God looked on the world with compassion. He says, boy, they don't know me, they, they don't have salvation, you know what? I'm going to step in and I'm going to put my love into action. I'm going to send my only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that those who call upon him for salvation, they indeed can and will be saved. So as you and I look on the lost and dying world, let me challenge you, don't just, don't just look on the world with pity. Look upon the world with compassion. And again, as we talk about faith promise and we talk about doing what God would have us to do in giving and in praying and in going for missions, hey, that's putting our love into action. Or as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, this is a way to prove the sincerity of our love. Jesus lifted his eyes. He looked on this multitude with compassion. But now notice in verse number five, he says to Philip, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? You see, if Jesus were to ask the question, where are we going to buy bread so that we can eat? That's Jesus and the twelve. That would not have been an unusual question. But that's not what Jesus asked. He says, whence shall we buy bread that these, this whole multitude may eat? Now, I want to remind you of a very uh, important yet simple theological truth this morning. Think about this. God never asks a question to gain information. Isn't that true? Because God already knows all things. So he's not asking this question because he doesn't know. Jesus is not wringing his hands wondering, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed these people? This is an impossible situation. But no, verse 6, the Bible says, this he said to prove him. That is to test him, to examine him. Why? The Bible says, for he himself knew what he would do. I want to remind you that this Faith Promise Missions Conference for Evangelical Baptist Church really is just like this. Jesus is asking you as a church, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? The 7.5 billion people in the world today, it would not necessarily be unusual to ask the question, hey, where can we buy bread so that we could eat this group here? But you see, the Missions Conference takes us beyond here and looks to the multitude and said, hey, what are we going to do about those who never have heard of, of Jesus Christ, those who've never heard the plan of salvation, those who have never partaken of Him? I want to remind you, Jesus is not in heaven this morning wringing His hands wondering, how are we going to do this? Those missionaries on that board back there, how are we going to keep supporting them? How about these other missionaries that want to go? How are we going to do this? No, no, Jesus doesn't have any problems with finances. You see, he's not asking the question because he does not know. He's asking this question to prove you, to prove you individually and to prove you as a church. This is a test, and I guess the question we should ask this morning is, will you pass the test? You say, how do I pass the test, preacher? Well, it's pretty simple. You just do what God wants you to do. And really, kind of part of the test is this piece of paper. And remember when you were in school and you'd go into a classroom and the teacher would say, all right, everybody put away your books, take out a pencil, and some, sometimes they say, and a half sheet of paper. You know, this is kind of like the test, but it's not a pop quiz. You knew it was coming. We prepared you for it all throughout this conference. The question is, will you put down on this piece of paper what God wants you to put down on this piece of paper. Will you pass that test? Now, Philip gives an answer, verse number seven. He says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. That would be maybe 200 days worth of wages, so it's a pretty good chunk of change. He says, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. So you see, Philip is focused on the physical bread. But along comes Andrew, I like Andrew, verses 8 and 9. Verse 9, he says, there's a lad here. And one of the reasons I like Andrew is because he's bringing people to Christ. You see, 
he brought his brother Peter to Christ already in chapter 1 of the book of John. And later in, in John chapter number 12, he and Philip will bring some Greeks to Jesus Christ. But you and I need to bring others to Christ as well. I want to make this distinction as we talk about faith promise giving and giving to missions. We don't write a figure on this card and say, you know what, now that I'm giving to missions so that missionaries can go on my behalf, now this negates my own responsibility to bring others to Christ. No, no, no. We are to bring others to Christ along with doing what we can to tell others about Christ in places where we will probably not be able to visit on this side of eternity. Think about it. Bring others to Christ. Ask them, do, they, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Have you been born again? Or, hey, would you come along with me to Evangelical Baptist Church this Sunday? And maybe it means you've got to stop and get a donut or get some breakfast along the way. But do what you can to bring others to Christ. But as Andrew brings this lad to Christ, in verse 9, he says, concerning the lad, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. And then he asks this question, but what are they? among so many. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if you notice things like this or not, but when I read scripture, I notice this. It says, which have five barley loaves and two small fishes. I asked the question this morning, do you think it really would have mattered if they were large fishes? <laughs> I don't think so. That's not the point here. By the way, I can tell you about large fishes. I, I lived in Alaska for 10 years. When you fish there, you catch a salmon. An average size salmon is 15 pounds. Um, if you go halibut fishing, one halibut can be three to 400 pounds for one fish. <laughs> I remember when I first moved back to Tennessee and I'd go to the office in the morning and they start talking about the fact that they've been fishing the night before. And uh, they said, yeah, I mean, I caught a three pound bass. And I thought, wow, that's bait, you know, that's just, that's just a whole different perspective. But, but you see, the thing here is, it's not about the size of the fish, it's about the size of the faith. And that's what makes all the difference in the world. Andrew, I believe, is lacking a little bit of faith, but it's interesting, as we move along here now, the provision of food for the people, the proving of the disciples, point number one. Now, point number two, the provision of food for the people... Jesus gives his answer in verse number 10. I love this answer. He says, make the men sit down. It's as if he's saying to them, you know, I'm not going to give you an answer in words. I'm going to show you the answer to your question, Andrew. Make the men sit down. And the book of Mark says it was in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Obviously, this was good for organization. The Bible says there was much grass in the place. And then the Bible says, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Now, because you have heard this story before, you remember that the book of Matthew says there were 5,000 men besides women and children. So how many people were there that day? Can we estimate that maybe there was 10,000 there and still be on the conservative side of estimating? Quite possibly. But you see, here's the point. It doesn't really matter how many were there as far as an exact number. Here's the point. Jesus is teaching his disciples that no matter how hard they try, that they, in and of themselves, could never feed that many people with five loaves and two small fishes. In their own strength, this was impossible. I want to remind you this morning, when we talk about 7.5 billion people in the world today, I, I'm thankful for everybody that showed up here at church this morning. This is wonderful. But look around. I don't think we have enough here to reach 7.5 billion people in and of our own strength. However, God says, you know what? I've made a way that as you get involved in and through your local church, that that gospel can be spread all around the world. We cannot do it in our own strength, but we need to understand that we can experience His strength through our weakness, that we are laborers together with one another, but also, the Bible says, with God, and that, indeed, we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth us. Now, watch as this story continues to unfold in verse number 11. The Bible says, Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, and the book of Mark tells us that he broke the loaves, and he divided the two fishes, he distributed to the disciples, and then the Bible says, and the disciples to them that were set down. And the Bible also says, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And if you look there in verse number 12, you'll see that the Bible says that they were filled. Now, 
I don't know, some of you may or may not do this when you read scripture. I, I like to read scripture and then I like to use my sanctified imagination. Some of you may find this difficult, but I'm going to ask you this morning, would you use your sanctified imagination with me today? Have you ever thought about this story? Have you ever thought about how it takes place? How did all this come to be and all these people got fed? Now, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to give you what my sanctified imagination sees this morning, and I want you to think about this story with me. First of all, I believe Jesus has this basket, and it has the five loaves and the two small fishes in this basket. I believe that he says to the disciples, okay, fellas, line up. So this morning, we have with us right here, disciple number one. Here is disciple number two, and here's disciple number three, and number four, number five, all the way down here to disciple number 12. Now, does everybody see the disciples standing up here? Okay, some of you are with me, all right? The rest of you, you'll catch up with me in a little bit, all right? Just hang tight with me, all right? So now, <clears throat> the disciples have lined up. Each of them, they have their own basket. It's an empty basket. They're ready. And, oh, by the way, I, I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, Brother Snyder, where did those disciples each get their own empty basket? <laughs> to you, I would say, hey, take it easy on me. This is my sanctified imagination, okay? But also, I would remind you that the Bible says that when they got done, they took up 12 baskets that remained of everything that was left over. So now, can you imagine with me as Jesus takes what he has, those five loaves, and I'm just going to say, for my sanctified imagination, he breaks each of them into half, because the book of Mark tells us he broke them. So that gives us 10 pieces of bread. Then Jesus takes those two small fishes, and he breaks each of them into half. That gives us four pieces of fish. Now try to imagine as Jesus takes that basket, he comes over to disciple number one and gives to disciple number one piece of bread number one. And then to disciple number two, piece of bread number two. And then number three, number four, number five, all the way down here to disciple number 10. Now have you ever thought about who disciple number 11 is? I don't know. But I think maybe it was Philip. Remember the one who said 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient? Can you imagine being this disciple? You're standing here, you're holding a basket that's empty, and you're watching because you know these guys have been counting the pieces of bread as Jesus passes it out. And now as Jesus comes to you, can you imagine as he reaches into his basket and pulls out of his basket piece of bread number 11 and puts it into your basket? I don't know about you. But if I were this disciple, I'd be standing here staring at that piece of bread because you realize it did not exist just moments prior to Jesus coming down this line. And then there's disciple number 12, and he's standing there. He's watching all this take place, and he's wondering what's going to happen when he gets to me. And can you imagine as Jesus reaches into his basket and puts piece of bread number 12 into the basket of disciple number 12? Now, folks, I'm telling you, you talk about fresh bread it doesn't get any fresher than those two right down here. It didn't exist just moments prior to Jesus coming down. But I remind you, the miracle's not over. Can you imagine now as Jesus comes back to disciple number one, and he gives him piece of fish number one, and then to disciple number two, piece of fish number two, and then disciple three, piece of fish number three, and then number four. And Have you ever thought about who disciple number five was? You know, I don't know, but my sanctified imagination sees it being Andrew. Remember the one who talked about the two small fish? <laughs> but what are they among so many? Can you imagine, though, being disciple number five, holding that basket, and now Jesus reaches into his basket and pulls out piece of fish number five and puts it into your basket. And then number six, and then number seven, number eight, all the way down to disciple number 12, who gets piece of fish number 12. Now, I understand that, you know, New England has a reputation for fresh seafood, but you're not going to beat this seafood right here, okay? This was just created by the creator of the universe. I don't know about you folks. I would have loved to have been a disciple down on this end of the line, standing there holding something that Jesus just created. But I got to remind you, the miracle's not over. Because now, Jesus says to the disciples, okay, fellas, go feed the people. Now, let's be honest this morning. Be transparent. If you were a disciple, what would you do right now? How would you go about feeding all of these people? 
I, I'm not sure, but being transparent for me, sometimes my faith gets a little bit weak. And, 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 and I try to imagine, you know, I would probably go find me a group of 50, you know, rather than 100, because that makes the food go a little bit further. So I would probably come to this first group and I would say to this first group, now listen, folks, I only have a little bit of food, so I'm just going to give you what I have. And here's half of the bread that I have. Here's half of the fish that I have. If you would, just treat this like an appetizer, you know, just, just enough to hold you over until you can get home. And, you know, then I would probably come over here and I'd find me a second group of 50 because, again, it goes further. And to them, I would probably just pull out from my basket, here's the rest of the bread I have, here's the rest of the fish that I have. And, you know, again, just use this as an appetizer and, and, and maybe hopefully it'll get you home. Again, I ask you, what do you do now? What's your next step? You know, I don't know, but I try to imagine being a disciple. I would probably just have to come up to this next group and say to this group, you know, folks, I really have no idea what I'm going to give to you, but I'm going to reach into my basket because the master has told us we're supposed to feed you, and you know what? I have some bread here for you all of a sudden, and, and you know what? I have a feeling that, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have some fish here for you, and you know what? You just, you just go ahead and eat that, and you know, there's probably going to be more to go around here. And, you know, at this point, I'd have to come back to that first group. I'd have to apologize to them for, for my lack of faith. And I'd say, folks I, folks, I am so sorry about this. And, you know what? what? Yeah, here's some more bread for you. And I think, pro yep, and here's some more fish. Now, folks, you just eat that. If you want more, you let me know. And then I'd have to come back here. I'd have to apologize to the second group. And, again, I'd reach into my basket. Hey, here's some more bread. Here's some more fish. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But most likely, that must have gone on for hours. All of those people, just 12 disciples, passing out that food. What an amazing thing that must have been to be part of that miracle. I don't know about you. I would have loved to have been one of those disciples to see this actually take place and to be part of it. I want to remind you this morning as we talk about this miracle that spiritually speaking, God gives you and I the opportunity to be involved in this miracle. It's called faith promise giving. You say, now wait a minute, preacher. How do you see faith promise giving in that story? Well, here's how I see it. You remember that lad who came and gave his lunch to Jesus? We've been talking about coming and bringing our offering and giving it to Jesus, this mission's offering. Now, again, some would say, what do you mean give it to Jesus? Well, does not the Bible say that the church is his body? So as we come and we give that offering to the local church, we give it to Jesus, and then this church collects that offering and does what? Then distributes it, that missions offering, to who? Missionaries. Just like we saw Jesus distribute it to the disciples. And then those missionaries take that which was given, and they go to people groups of 50 and 100 and 50,000 and 100,000, yea, even millions upon billions of people around the world, and tell them about the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Now, folks, that is an amazing miracle that God gives you and I the opportunity to be part of. I don't know about you. I don't want to miss out on being part of that miracle. But as we think about that, a couple things I want you to think about. Number one, we have to be like that lad. We have to be like that lad. You know, I have two boys. They're both grown. One is married, he's out of the home, and the other one's sophomore and finishing up a sophomore year in Bible college. And, you know, I remember when they were teenagers, it would not have been easy for them to give up their lunch, okay? They ate a lot. This lad, apparently, very freely gave up his lunch to Jesus. And here's the thing. He gave everything that Jesus asked for. For him, it was five loaves and two small fishes. I'm glad that that lad didn't say to Jesus, well, Jesus, you know, I, I better save some in reserve and I'll just give you one loaf and I'll just give you one fish. But no, he was asked for the five loaves and the two small fishes and you know what he gave? Five loaves and two small fishes. Let me encourage you today as we talk about faith promise and giving, give everything that God asks you to give. Don't bargain with God. Now, I know everybody in here, it's going to be different for each of you. You see, some of you folks over here, God's going to say, you know what, I want seven loaves and I want ten fish. 
And for over here, some of you, God's going to say, hey, I want 15 loaves and I want one fish. I don't know what God's going to speak to each one of you about, but that's why we've said, you pray. Ask God what He would have you to give. And whatever it is He wants you to give, give it all. Don't bargain with God. But also, let me throw out this other practical thought. You know, this young man, he gave out of that which he had. There was a performance out of that which he had. He didn't say to Jesus, well, Jesus, once I get some sort of special offering from you, <laughs> then uh, I'll, I'll give it. No, he gave what he had. A performance out of that which he had, which is faith promise giving. But there's one other thing I need to talk about before we move on. It's this. These disciples, they have finally, in our story, in my sanctified imagination, they finally passed out all of the, the bread and the fish, and they've lined back up here again. We've got disciple number one, two, three, four, all the way down here to disciple number 12. Now, does everybody see those disciples? Okay, some, I've gained a few of you. I, I'm feeling good about this. Okay, good. Now, those disciples, we said they represent missionaries. And here's my challenge this morning. Would you be willing to line up with these missionaries. Perhaps you're here this morning and God has spoken or is speaking to your heart about being a full-time missionary for Him. To go to some part in the world where maybe you've never been before, but God's speaking to your heart about going there. Let me encourage you, surrender to do God's will. I talk to a lot of people about this and often I'm met with this response. Well, preacher, you don't understand. I, I was born and raised in this particular area. and I don't know anything but English. I've never been to Bible college. I'd have to surrender and go to Bible college. And then if I move somewhere else, I don't know how you move to another country. And once I got there, I'd have to learn that new culture. And boy, then I'd have to also learn another language. And how do you go in and start a church? And, all? and again, I remind all of us this morning, those disciples, no matter how hard they tried, could never feed all of those people in and of their own strength. So also the missionary that God calls, he can never go to that field in his own strength and do what needs to be done. It is God's power that works through the missionary to accomplish what needs to be done. It's just a matter of us saying, hey, I'm willing to step up. I'm willing to step out. I'm willing to be obedient and do that which God is calling me to do. Are you willing to line up with these disciples today? Oh, dear friends, there's more I'd like to say. I, I, I just, boy, I, let, me, let me just move on quickly. It's interesting because the Bible does say that there were 12 baskets that were left over. I don't think that's coincidence there were 12 disciples and 12 baskets because it made them think about what they started with and now what they have. But have you ever thought about <laughs> what did they do with those 12 baskets? That's just the way I think, you know. What did they do with them? I have no idea. I'm just being honest, but... I do have a sanctified imagination that has thought about that. I'm not sure, but I believe they gave those 12 baskets to the lad. You see, that lad freely gave up his lunch. And remember in Sunday school, we went to Luke chapter 6, and it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, 12 baskets full. No, it doesn't say that, but you got my point. <laughs> You can't outgive God no matter how hard you try. Can you imagine if that's what happened as that lad went home that day? Can you imagine as he walks into the house and says, Hey, Mom, here's what's left over from the lunch you packed for me this morning. Now, you moms in here, can't you hear that mom saying, All right, boy, what have you been up to today? <laughs> Fill me in. But can you imagine as that lad got to tell his mom, about what Jesus did with those five loaves and those two small fishes. Oh, what an amazing story he had to tell, not just to his mom, but I believe even for the rest of his life. And by the way, we have an amazing story to tell to a lost and a dying world also. But there's one other thing that I need to talk to you about this morning here from John chapter number 6. And that's our third point today, the proclamation about the bread of life. Look with me, beginning in verse number 47. The Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus uses the context here of John 6 to preach about the fact that he is indeed the bread of life. Look at verse 47. 
Eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. He said, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I want to point out that the opposite of that is also true. Those who do not believe on Jesus do not have eternal life. Jesus, as he spoke with Nicodemus in John chapter number 3, verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because why? He hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what that tells us this morning is that in order to die and spend an eternity in a place called hell, all we have to do really is nothing. <laughs> Just live our lives however we want, whether moral, immoral, or anywhere in between. But if there's never a time in our lives when we believe on Jesus, the Bible says if we die in that state, we will spend an eternity in a place called hell. And I remind you this morning that hell is real. It's not just some cuss word that we hear used way too often in our world today. It's an awful place that I can't even describe to you just how awful it really is. But Jesus said if we will believe on Him, we will have eternal life, we'll escape hell, and we will gain eternity in heaven with Him. Jesus is that bread of life. Verse 49 tells us that, you know, earthly bread, it, it only sustains us temporarily. He says, your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness. And by the way, that was definitely some bread from heaven, but that was not the bread from heaven because he says this, and are dead. I remind you this morning, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You know, I, I talk to people a lot about salvation and eternity and sometimes I get this response well preacher I'm young I'm healthy and I've got a long life ahead of me and I'll, I'll look towards salvation sometime down the road and you know when that thought comes to me of well I've got a long life ahead of me here's my response prove it prove it you realize that one blood clot can change or end your life in just a matter of seconds are we ready to meet God? The Bible says that eternal life is only found in Jesus Christ. We must partake of Him who is the bread of life. The bread, verse 50, which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Jesus said in verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. He says, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. You see, Man has sustained life, but Jesus Christ gives eternal life. There's a big difference there. He says, the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This kind of comes back to what Pastor mentioned earlier in the service today, the death of Jesus Christ. Why is the death of Jesus Christ so important? I want you to think about this with me this morning. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So what the Bible is telling us is that the only wage or the only payment for sin is death, period. That being the case, we have two options today. Here is option number one. Option number one is we can live our life however we want to, moral, immoral, anywhere in between. But if we die without Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we never believe on Him, the Bible says we will go to that place called hell because the Bible talks about in Revelation, verse, chapter 21, that all those who are unbelievers will spend eternity in a place of fire and brimstone, and here's what the Bible says, which is the second death. Eternal death in a place called hell. So option number one is live our lives, however. And, and people say to me, now wait a minute, preacher, you don't understand. I, I, I'm a good person. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I have people say to me, wait a minute, preacher, you don't understand. I'm going to heaven because, you see, well, I'm Catholic. Or I'm going to heaven because I'm Presbyterian. Or I'm going to heaven because I'm Lutheran or... Pastor, I've heard some really strange people. Hey, I'm going to heaven because I'm independent Baptist. I want to remind us this morning that salvation has nothing to do with a religion, but has everything to do with a relationship to Jesus Christ. The question today is, have you ever accepted Him as your personal Savior? Have you partaken of Him who is the bread of life? That's option number one, to die in our sins, an eternal death in hell. 
I don't like option number one. But this morning, I want to tell you about option number two. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Jesus died. The wages of sin is death. And what Jesus does is He offers His death in place of our eternal death in hell. The question is, has there ever been a time when we have accepted Him as our Savior, when we have received that gift of eternal life and said to Jesus, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I, I can't save myself. And we look to Him and Him alone for salvation, understanding that we must take His death and put it in place of our death if we're going to have that eternal life that comes only through Jesus Christ. Oh, dear friend, do you know Jesus Christ today? I didn't ask you if you're a good person. I didn't ask you if you're a Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian. I didn't ask you if you're an independent Baptist. I didn't ask you if you are a member of this church or not. My question to you today is this. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you're here today without Jesus Christ... I want to invite you to come to Him today. In just a moment, we're going to have what we call an invitation. If you're not familiar with that, we're going to invite you to come to Jesus today for salvation. Before you leave this place, you can know for sure that if you were to die, even today, you would be on your way to heaven. But Christian, what about it? We have an amazing story to tell to a lost and a dying world about the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes unto the Father but by Him, that He is indeed the bread of life, and that there's no other way of salvation apart from Him. Are we willing to be like that lad? Are we willing to do what He puts on our hearts to do, to be obedient to Him? Are we willing to step up with these disciples and step out in obedience to Him in the area of missionary service? Oh, dear friend, whatever it is that God is speaking to your heart about today, would you please respond to him? 